This is the steering of the thing. You don't want customers having trouble steering their boats. And one of the most important guards, the prop guard. Make sure it's there, there aren't any broken bars on this. Finally, make sure safety decals are in place and readable. Now, this is a gas. Let's take a look at an electric motor. What's the difference? Here's a quick quiz. What's the difference between gas and electric? Time's up. No gas tank. Duh. Still, a few things to look at here. Play on your throttle. That's the right side button. And if you have any aftermarket add-ons, maybe some squirt guns, that's this pump here. Want to make sure the housing's on straight, which this isn't. We'll be tightening this down here in a second. And the same concern for guards, especially the prop guard. Make sure it is completely in place. Now, we brought in an example of a motor that shouldn't even be working. Take a look. These are some of the things we talk about. No safety stickers. Plenty of corrosion here. And look at this. The prop guard, it's a rumor. This motor should definitely be tagged and taken out of service immediately. This will not go on any boat today. Now, the electric motors, you need to look under the cover every 100 hours. That's about every week if you're busy, maybe every two weeks in the uh, slow season. No gas tank to remove, just the cover. You've got uh, screws that you have to remove. And the cover comes straight up and over the throttle. Now, you might have one thing to disconnect along the way. And if you have the squirt gun attachments, there's a quick release for them as well, just like the fuel tank. First thing you're going to check out is your switches. How are the contacts down here? Any corrosion on the contacts? I'm going to check all the wires out. Any signs of corrosion here? Any loose connections? I'm going to check the optional support pump. Is it attached firmly? The main power in connector. You're going to look inside here. Is there any corrosion on the contacts? Now there is a great product to keep water out of the motors. I like to call it corrosion block. Actually, it's called corrosion block. You can spray this on everything when you have the cover off. It really does a good job keeping water out. Now, let's go inside the motor cover plate. Going to look at the main inputs here, looking for corrosion. There's just a little bit here, but this actually is not very bad. Now we're going to go inside of that and remove the brush holder, and we're going to take a look at the brushes. Any corrosion here? Now this is in pretty good shape. Now if there were any corrosion, you have to clean it before you add any more corrosion block. Give it a good cleaning first and then give it all another nice new coat of corrosion block. Inspecting under the gas tank is part of your regularly scheduled maintenance or your 100 hour schedule. And the first thing you do is close the vent on your gas tank. This is actually the only time you'll ever do that. And the reason is simple. You don't want to spill gas while you're taking the tank off. So you close up the vent and then you're going to remove this strap that secures the tank to the engine. You lift straight up and there's only one thing to disconnect and that is the fuel line. And there is a quick disconnect right here, which is great. You don't spill any fuel. And it gives you the opportunity to check the fuel line and the fuel filter. Want to make sure the fuel line is free of any cracks or breaks. Make sure the fuel filter is nice and clean. We're going to check the choke mechanism. Make sure it has play. You're going to check the throttle action. And we're going to show you in a second here how to actually lubricate the cable. Going to look at the spark plug. Look at all the electrical connections. Spark plug goes here. And you're going to check all of your electrical connections to make sure they're secure all the way down to the stop button. All right, let's talk about lubricating this throttle cable. I've got the cable luber on here. By the way, you can buy one of these out of the J&J &J catalog. It works great. Put one end in here, and you're going to take your cable lubricant, force it through here. This gets any excess water out of the throttle cable, and it really serves a two-fold purpose. Gets water out, extends the life of the cable, and ensures nice, even lubrication for the entire throttle cable. The shear pin is the one part of the motor that is actually designed to break. I know, what do, what do I mean by that, right? Well, figure it out. The propeller gets caught on something in the water, a customer's hat, piece of debris. Shear pin breaks off inside, propeller stops turning, gives you plenty of time to turn off the motor. Now you've got to replace the shear pin. Very easy to get to it. You're going to remove the prop guard, bolts, unscrew, cage comes out. You remove the cotter pin that's holding the prop on, 
pull the prop straight off and the shear pin is right here. Now, of course, it will be broken when you replace it. The new one simply goes in its place. Make sure you lube it up a little bit with some grease to help it stay in place. Replace the propeller. Put in a new cotter pin. Don't forget to flare it to hold the propeller in place. It's that easy and you're back in action very quickly. Finishing up with fluids now, again, when you fill the gas tank, make sure it is one inch below the neck. That is your proper gas level. Make sure the gas cap is on nice and tight. Now, let's talk about lubricants, oil. Here's your oil cap right here. There is a dipstick, but the dipstick really doesn't give you the oil level. Generally, 10W30 weight on these motors. Please consult, though, your J&J &J manual for the exact oil you should be using with your motor. The oil level up to the top of the threads. This, you look at that, that's not even to the bottom of the threads. We're going to have to top this baby off before we go to work today. By the way, oil change should be every 100 hours and you should check it every day. Now, let's go down to the gear case. 90 weight gear oil in here. Every 200 hours is the scheduled maintenance. How about the float bowl? Got to drain water out of there. Make sure the gas switch is in the off position. And all you got to do is loosen this wing nut about two turns and you'll get that little bit of dirty water dribbling out of there. Make sure you use a proper receptacle for it, not a styrofoam cup. You want to dispose of it, be nice to mother nature, and frankly, keep the shop clean because a clean shop is a happy shop and a happy shop is usually a profitable one. All right, that's it for the gas motor. A couple of turns, tighten it back up, just a hand tightness, that's fine for the float bowl. On the electric, really not much different. The only thing you have to worry about, actually, there's no oil, but you do have a gear case. And please, again, consult the J&J &J manual for the quantity and type of lubricant here. Hey, let's spend a second talking about dock rails and dock rail placement. The key to where you put the rails is the customer should be able to easily step out of the boat in one step. I know it's different with little kids, but you've got to find a happy medium and how an average adult can step out of the boat. We have two different kinds of dock rails available at J&J, &J, stainless steel, and there's also a powder-coated stainless steel, a very nice blue color. Let's talk about rope tying and tethering. Now, you don't need to be a Navy veteran to know how to tie these knots. We've got all the instructions on tying the rope in the J&J &J workshop manual, so please refer to that. The FID is your tool for tying this hollow nylon rope, which is perfect for the purpose. It's very durable, and the more you pull on these knots, the tighter they get. You'll get good long life out of this hollow nylon rope. How do you decide how long your rope tethers need to be? Two rules of thumb, and it's all determined by the water level in your pond. If the boat ends up more than six inches away over the water, you have a little danger for customers getting on board, especially the youngsters. If it's too short, if you have less than six inches from the edge of the pond, it actually becomes difficult to unhook the ropes. So the key is to find a happy medium. Now, here we are out on the white waters cascading down. Let's talk about how to float your boat. Tube in the water, valve up. We are ready to install the hull. It's a one-piece operation, very, very easy to do. Dan brought a little help here. He's going to step in and we're going to roll the hull right on to the tube. Now there's no attachment, no adhesives, it just sets down in the tube and the important thing is to make sure the valve itself is around the back side of the seat. That way customers don't step on it while they're getting on board. Battery installation. Your electric motor uh, boat has four batteries inside. They are six volt deep cycle batteries, just like you put in your everyday golf cart. So think of your bumper boat as a golf cart on the water. Now the hull of the boat opens up like a clam shell. You're going to use a stick which is provided to prop it open. Now this is definitely a two person job because you got to get these fairly heavy batteries into the boat. Remember to always use proper lifting techniques. Lift with your knees, prop it up on the edge of the boat, and make sure your buddy has a good handhold before you let it go. Now for safety's sake, the batteries should all be facing the same way. This definitely helps with the wiring and be sure to use the uh, wiring connections per the J&J &J shop manual. A word or two about battery safety here. Be careful with tools around the terminals. 
have a little sparking danger. Also watch for any smoking coming out of the batteries. If you look right in the middle, the bilge pump can remove any excess water from the hole. When you wire it up, you should make